Well, welcome to another episode of Beyond the Wall. This is my life story before, during, and after incarceration. I spent the last 25 years of my life, and right now, I'm just taking you guys on a journey on how it is to come back to the real world and the changes and stuff that I'm going through. And um, today, I have my sister-in-law, Christy, with me, and she has some questions about how I'm dealing with, you know, the outside world and really just a different, she just wants to know, she's curious about, you know, my life and the things we've been going through. So without holding up your guys' time, I introduce my sister, Christy, say hi. Hello. Yeah, we just. Thanks for having me. Oh, <laughs> this is exciting, you know, this is. You know, you and I, we've had a lot of conversations, and I really believe that a lot of our conversation is pretty interesting, and maybe some people would like to be in on it and hear it, you know, because you come from a different perspective. You know, you have questions and stuff that, that I don't know if I can answer, but I would like to because the questions you have would be similar to the questions that people are viewing these shows, these episodes, would have, but I just don't know what they're interested in. And yeah, having you here is, I'm excited. So, so in, you know, like I said, I'm an open book. Whatever you feel like you want to know, ask. I'll try to answer it to the best of my ability. Well, you, you know, we do, we come from like very different places, but um, I think that a lot of the things that you say, I still, I think I do this normally in life. I try to relate to other people. Um, and I'm very interested in people and their lives and their stories. And so I really appreciate what you're doing by sharing your stories and just how open and honest you are. Um, it makes me feel comfortable to come in and ask whatever questions are kind of uh, percolating in my brain, you yeah. know, um, I ask somebody who's really just inquisitive, and uh, often I ask my sister, well, what about this? Like, when you were in prison, I would ask her questions, like, well, what about this? What about that? And my sister is always like, I don't ask those questions. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't ask very many questions, so, you know, but I think it works out for us a little bit that way. Because sometimes I'm afraid that to give her, because I've always been completely honest with her, you know, since from the first time I met her. And, you know, there's a lot of things that I've done, the stuff that I'm not proud of. And, you know, asking questions that people might have or whatever, I just didn't want to, like, scare her away or put her off. You know, before she got a chance to get to know who I am. I mean, I'm not even really sure exactly who I am. But with her, I was able to have a balance. I was able to escape my environment and generally enjoy, you know, our time, even if it's 15 minutes at a time, because that's all you get, 15-minute phone calls at a time. Then you got to wait for an hour before you can call back. You know, but the time that she came and visit, you know, we get to spend six, seven hours together for the weekend. You know, before, you know, when I first went into the system, we used to have visits on Wednesday, on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then when she, when uh, she decided to finally come and see me. And let me talk to her, and when our in our relationship progressed, you know they changed the visits to Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and now it's only Saturday and Sunday. You know the system they keep telling you that they promote strong family ties, but everything they do is really to restrict access to your family. You know people, you guys out here in the world, you guys have jobs, you guys have, you know livelihoods to take care of things, you guys have responsibility. You guys can't just get up and come and see us. So, you know, 
if you can find time here and there, that's when you're going to be able to come. But now they made it so where if you're not off on the weekend, you're not going to be able to come and see us, you know. But it's just it's just frustrating because of the contradiction because they tell you one thing, but their action shows you another, you know. Like when you get in trouble and stuff, the first thing they want to take you is your line of communication, your phone, your emails, like your visits. Like what is that having to do with you getting into an altercation, with you getting into a fight? You know? So when you get into a fight, they want you to be able to not talk to your family anymore, when maybe talking to your family would help you prevent from getting into a fight because you're able to talk to your kids or your wife or your, you know, your, your friends or whatever because you want to be able to escape that place as often as you can. And they, every opportunity they have, they try to make it, they try to remind you that you're in prison. Like, like you don't know. You wake up in an 8 by 12 cell, 9 by 6 12 cell every freaking day, but somehow... They still want to emphasize that you're in prison. Like, like I'm going to forget I'm in prison, you know? And that stuff, kind of stuff just pisses me off sometimes. And I'm sorry for getting animated. But, you know, it's frustrating because what the heck does me getting in a fight or having an altercation with somebody where have anything to do with calling home to my family, calling home to Laura? Don't have... Yeah, but, yeah. You have to go into the hall or whatever. Well, yeah, you know, like, before her, I never planned on coming home. I had 26 years to do. I was only 20, so I had to steal myself to make sure I get through the time. And the way I was, I mean, for a lack of better words, I was very active. You know, I was, I don't want to say undisciplined because I was always respectful and courteous, but I didn't care. You know, so I lived my life that way. My, my objective was to get through the day and deal with whatever it comes, comes through, you know. And some of the spots I've been in is practically a war zone. Like, I don't know any other way to say it. It's just literally every single day somebody's getting chopped up. You know, I'm not in, in, in the incident every single day or nothing like that. But that's the environment I live in. And, but every day is a potential wreck. You know, because I gamble. I hustle. You know, I'm active. And... When you're moving around in those environment like that, there's always a potential that the deal's gonna go bad, that somebody's not gonna honor their agreement, you know, for whatever reason. You know, a lot of times people that don't honor their agreement because they're trying to, they wanna try you to make sure to see if you can collect. You can't do business in prison if you can't collect. Other than that, you're just giving your stuff away, you know, or you're just, you just getting your shit took, you know, whatever. If you can't collect, if people don't feel like you can come and collect from them, you cannot conduct business in prison. So I was very active in conducting different type of business. And I had a few altercation in, but I had to make sure that I was able to, that I'm gonna come and collect. Rather I win or not, it's not, it's, not, it's not the point. It's the point that you're willing to do something to, to, you know, to ensure that you're respected. And at the end of the day, in prison, it doesn't matter how nice you are, how respectful you are, 
you know, all those things can always mis be misconstrued as weakness or soft or whatever. But the one language that everybody understands in prison that leaves no doubt, no matter what language you speak, is violence. Violence translates in every language, and there's no misunderstanding what you're saying. So at the end of the day, it's messed up that we, that our society is like that, that our environment is like that, but that's what they respect in there. Your capacity for violence and your willingness to commit these violence. You know. Well, I wanted to, um, I mean, we talked a little bit about my sister and family connections and <clears throat> something you said earlier, kind of like, I, I wasn't sure where we were going to take this conversation today, but something you said earlier piqued my interest in, you know, and every time we talk, this is kind of how our conversations go, like, will say something and I'm like, oh, about that. <laughs> you know, let's, let's, let me ask you another question. Um, so this morning I had no idea we were kind of trying to do this call and we were talking about um, we were talking about family and coming home and how great it's been to come home. And I kind of wanted to ask you a question about there was a video that you posted where you were visiting with your parents and your dad was, uh, you know, singing a song and he was like, he's very, uh, every time I've met your dad, he's just very kind and sweet and gentle and um, funny and welcoming and warm. And that's the person that I know of as your dad. And when we went away to prison, that wasn't, necessarily your experience or when you were growing up that wasn't necessarily your experience with your dad and you went away so young that you carried with you a, a image or a memory of your dad with you and now you're coming out of prison 25 years later and it's the experience is completely different and um, you have this opportunity to kind of like remake your relationship with your dad and I, I'm curious about that because I'll tell you like where my question is coming from and why I'm a little emotional about it is that my sister and I um, you might know but uh, you know we had a stepdad that was kind of abusive yeah. and he died when I was 12 and I always think about what life would be like if he would have lived all these years? You know, I'm 49 years old now. So, um, you know, he died, what, 37 years ago? If I do the math right? Yeah. So what if he had lived for 37 years? Would he be, like, I hated him when I was 12. I was glad he died when I was 12. But at 49... Would that relationship be different? And would he have grown into someone that is sweet and kind and gentle and loving like your dad? And I'm curious about like how your relationship is changing with your dad, you know, because I'm sure that it was very difficult. When you were a kid, your dad was trying to be a disciplinarian and you were the oldest kid. Yeah. And you were in a lot of trouble. Because <laughs> you were a menace to society. <laughs> well, you know... I know that's difficult to talk about, but I'm curious now you have this opportunity. Yeah, well, um, you know, I wasn't always this way. You know, I think I was a pretty good kid growing up. You know, when I became a menace, I was already little older for me to deal with my dad, you know, but, you know, like we had our difficult times and stuff, but is all culture is kind of screwed up in a certain way as far as we're not very affectionate. You know, they're married, like I see my little brother, John, growing up, you know, in, growing up here in America, being born in America, and the relationship he had with my mother 
and my father, you know, he would go and hug them, tell them good night, I love you. You know, I've never said that. I never told my mom I loved her till after I got locked up. You know, I've never said, hey, good morning, good night. Till this day, I don't even know the, those words, what, you know, that are used, you know, the Cambodian words for those, for those terms because we never used them. Our culture is structured as far as like, here's the father, here's the mother, here's the oldest son. Everybody loves everybody, but everybody understands their position and their role, you know. So, but at the same time, you know, we're refugees. We came to America in 84. I was born in a slave camp. I was born in 77. Pol Pot, if anybody knows history, like people here in America, they don't really know any other history besides you know, the Holocaust and a little bit of the Vietnam War because the Americans was involved in that. If the Americans wasn't involved in any of these wars or atrocities, we never hear about it because, I mean, it's American history. They don't really get into world history. You know, before I left, when I was in Florence, my Sally K, he, uh, he Googled, you know, the word, he ordered some magazines from National Geographic and he typed in the word, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam. And he wanted every article that National Geographic ever wrote that 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 had those num that had those uh words in them. You know, when we got the magazine, we got a little, little bit about the Vietnam War. But from 75 to 79, when Pol Pot was killing a third of the population, National Geographic, the World Magazine, never mentioned one word about it. And here was an atrocity that was going on that per capita was worse than the Holocaust. I don't take anything away from the suffering of all those people in the Holocaust. But you know, that you have hundreds of millions of Jews and then there was millions of Jews that suffered and died. In Cambodia, there was only 6 million people, 6.5 maybe. And the Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot killed 2.3 million of them, over a third of the population he slaughtered, you know, for, for his ideology or whatever. So, you know, here, just learning through the years, these psychiatrists, these therapists, these professionals and stuff, they tell you about PTSD, you know, people that go to war, you know, however, it doesn't matter how long they spent time in the war, whether it's six months or years, or just like Afghanistan, 20 years, in Iraq, they come back and they suffer from PTSD. And just like people that's been incarcerated, they say, you know, after six months, you're liable to suffer from PTSD. I'm sure I have the effects of them. I just don't recognize it yet. I mean, I do recognize a little stuff here that goes on and stuff, but, you know, being young and not understanding the environment, because you know, when you're kids, your parents shelter you. You don't know that you're poor. You don't know that you're starving. You don't know that you're being raised in a war zone. You're just a kid, and you have your little friends that you run around with, regardless of the atrocity that's going on around you. Your parents are, you know, protecting you from that. They're not telling you, oh, we're we're messed up right now. You know, we're getting we're getting slaughtered. You know, we're everybody's dying. We're starving. You know, they do everything to shelter you f from the reality. So, you don't understand your environment. And so, whatever happened, me growing up, I perceive it as a norm. Because it wasn't just happening in my household. Like, all my friends and everybody that I knew was going through the same thing. You know, but being incarcerated, being in prison... And growing over the years and start and finally learning my history that wasn't taught here in America, you know, because I met Laura and she would send me books and I inquire about, you know, that, that time. So learning the stuff, I was able to understand what my parents was going through. And understanding, you know, my dad had 18 people in his family. They all got murdered. They all died, whether it was 
you know, being killed, starvation, disease, however it came about, the only people that was left was my dad, me and my little brother, and my older sister, Patty, out of 18 people that, in his family. You know, and then my dad remarried my mom, which is my mom in every, you know, in every definition of the word. And being able to understand that the things that he went through and still him being in America, still providing for five kids, going home every day, I mean, going to work every day, coming home and just grinding away to make sure we had a roof over our head and food on the table gave me a different, gave me new new perspective. And that allowed me to let go of any type of animosity or negative feelings I have for him because I'm here in America. I had every opportunity in the world and I was even half the man as that he was after escaping of a war and all the stuff that he's gone through, all the losses that he suffered. I was given every opportunity here. I have no excuse. And to this day, I don't feel like I'm half the man that he's been. So that allows me, I don't have no right, I don't have no justification to hold any type of negative feelings or animosity. So. I don't even think about it, you know? I mean, sometimes it gets frustrated because he's like, well, what are you doing for a job? You can't be living off your wife. You, you know, what are you gonna do this? And, you know, but that's dad, you know? And, and it does get irksome sometimes, but as far as, you know, you seeing how, you know, coming back here and how I perceive him and our relationship and stuff, I don't really feel like I'm building a new relationship or, I'm getting to know the man that he is today for the first time because he's always been that, you know? And so it's just, it's just a natural flow. I mean, you know, I've been able through the years to be able to connect with my family because of Laura. You know, when she's home, when she's there at family functions and when she's just visiting, I was able to call and communicate with them. But, you know, before I met her, I'd call my mom once, maybe twice a month, just because I decided to leave the outside world behind me, you know, because I didn't have any expectations of getting through the end of the tunnel, because it's so far away, like I tell people, you can't even right now, today, you couldn't even imagine your life five years from now, 10 years from now. So how was I, just a kid, not knowing nothing about the world and life, can project myself 20 years into the future on the day I'm gonna get home and what I'm gonna do. So I never lived my life for my release. I just lived it to survive that environment that I was in day to day. But meeting Laura, she gave me hope. You know, she allowed me to dream about the future and yeah, I always tell her she saved me, and I really mean that because, like I told you before, you know, other instead of turning a, you know, what they call a, an ant hill into a mountain with every little incident, I was able to keep it in its perspective. Like, okay, maybe this went sideways a little bit, but it's not so serious where I have to take it to the extreme. Why? Because I didn't want to lose my visit again. I already lost, you know, when she decided to come and, and see me, I'd already lost my visit for four years because I had stabbed a guy in, in Victorville. That's how I ended up in Beaumont. And like I said, what does any of that have to do with my phone, my visit, my email? You know, it's an altercation that's being, that's happened inside the prison because of whatever reason, but they want to punish me by restricting my communication with the outside world, which the outside world is what might keep me from not being crazy, you know? So when I was in Atwater, I was at the last end of my leg of my four year uh, restriction and another altercation or whatnot would just 
compile, you know, we just add and extend my restriction. And so when there were things that came up, I didn't want to not be able to see Laura. So I made not necessarily better decisions. I just made a different one, you know, because, because I had something to look forward to. And yeah, I credit her for my sanity for one. Yeah, and for, yeah, she said, I don't know how to express, like, for the rest of my existence, I will always be grateful for what she's brought into my life, you know, because I don't like a lot of the stuff that I've done or the stuff that I had to do, but... You know, no matter how I tell the stories on um, Welcome to the USP, I'm not glorifying the violence or the chaos in there. I'm just telling you what happened. You know, and maybe some people will want a, you know, a PG version of it or whatever, but that's not the truth. We don't live in a PG world. Our environment is not that. Our environment is chaotic, it's violent, and it's, and it's sad, you know, but, yeah, I, <laughs> I'm just babbling, I'm just running my mouth. <laughs> That's okay, I, uh, we're probably running short on time for this video, but, like, everything you're saying is making me think of more questions. You know, I always tell her that, you know, I admire her, her strength and her courage and her heart. She has such a kind heart, you know, for her to love someone like me, like, she's truly a special person, you know, and then for her to go on her own, literally on her own, to meet my family, it's... It's something else because I don't know if I could have done what she's done. I don't know any, I'd absolutely know nobody else could have done what she has done as far as holding me down and waiting for me for all these years. And, you know, I've been, I tell her all the time, like, I'm the envy of all everybody in prison because, you know, everybody writes songs about this type of stuff, about their ride or die chick. Your gangster chick, the one that's gonna hold them down. But they all have the same story. They don't have her. I have her. Every single day I call her. Every single day I was able to talk to her and everything I ever needed, you know, because I'm a screw up. I've I've not been a a responsible person the way I should be. I've I've had my vices, I've had my weaknesses, and I've gotten myself in situations, and she was there every single day. She picked up every single call. Like, there's no word to express, you know, what she means to me. And, yeah, when I tell her she saved me, man, it's... It's not, it's, you know, she saved my soul, she saved my mind, she saved my body, she saved my whole being. And, you know, it puts my love for her into a whole different realm. 
You gotta tell her she's the best person I know, and I mean that. I don't know no nobody better than her. And I'm just so grateful and so blessed. And that's you know that's the part that I have a, you know trouble with is. I know what I've done. I know the kind of person that I that I am at times and how do I being in the environment that I've been in doing the things that I've done how do I how have I been able to receive such a blessing? You know, I dealt with that a lot, you know, through the years because You know, a lot of things that, I've, you know, I've told her I break everything I touch. And I didn't want to affect her in such a way, you know. And regardless of all the things I've done, all the times I went to the shoe, you know, I spent two years just from 2015 to 2017 in the shoe, not being able to talk to her. You know, I wrote her every single day, like literally, like every single day. She got like three letters on the weekend, you know, because she was my escape. I set a time every single day when I was in the shoe from this hour to this hour that I would spend talking to her through my pen and paper, you know, because Talking to her in my head out loud would probably make myself think I'm crazy, right? So I just sit and I wrote her every day and, you know, she, a lot of people go crazy in there, you know, doing the time that I've done and spending the amount of time isolated in the, in the hole, the shoe. And yeah, it's just, it's been such a wonderful blessing and you know, coming out here now, you know, we had a little, she was concerned, I was concerned how would it would really be when we're physically together and it's been seamless. Everything with her is natural. I don't, I don't care where I'm at. If I'm with her, like it took us 11 hours to drive, a seven hour drive, eight hour drive, but the time didn't seem to exist. It doesn't exist for me, you know, so. That everything about this transition is the way it is because of her. You know. Yeah. I love that you love my sister so much, and I know that she loves you, and I think that's why our family is able to embrace you. You know, this is a very unconventional way to meet someone, um, to build a relationship, and you know, you tell people, they're like, what the heck? Like, that's crazy. But, yeah. um, I think, you know, because she has shared you with us over the years and been open and honest about the relationship <clears throat> the love that you guys have for each other, it's been a lot easier for us to embrace you. Yeah, and I'm so, you know, not just being grateful for her, but for you guys and for my family, because it's not easy, especially for her through these last 17, 18 years. Yeah, without your support, without my family's support, it would have been, a, it would have been difficult. And I'm so grateful for your guys' acceptance and your love and your support for our relationship. Because I know she's determined she would have done it regardless how anybody else feel, but it, it just made it so much easier, I mean, lack for a better word, easier that everybody around her, you know, supported us. And, you know, regardless of the things that I've done and do, whatever, I feel like I've always been an honest person, you know, as far as my feelings for people. Like, there's no misunderstanding about how I feel about someone, you know? In there, out here, people know exactly 
I don't sugarcoat things and you know the things that that I made sure that I that I did when I met her was to be honest with her so that she can decide if this is the person that she you know after knowing everything about me if she still wants me you know and accepted me and she did and for that it's just it's beyond words you know cuz like I said, I don't think I'm an easy person to <laughs> to love, you know. And yeah, she definitely inspired me to be a better person. To continually, you know, my mindset is I don't feel that I'm worthy of her and her love and their sacrifices and all the things that come with it. But I want to be. So that's what my goal is is to eventually be the man that she thinks that I am and be worthy of, of her love. Well, just like tying that back to kind of where I was starting out the conversation with your dad, something I've noticed about your dad is that he reveres your mom and he listens to your mom and he believes that, you know, he should follow her, you know, normally the man thinks he should be the leader of the household and, and, and the wife should follow everything he says. And something I've noticed that's different about your dad is he looks to your mom. He puts her on a pedestal and he, um, he really admires her and listens to her and thinks that she, you know, knows the way of things. And so I don't know if your dad had that influence on you, but I see that you treat my sister very much the same way. You put her at a pedestal. Well, and I don't know about... I appreciate that. Yeah, I don't know it about anybody's relationship, but if you really care about the individual, you're going to really recognize the individual's worth. You know? And I think that's all it is. In some, I don't have any ego or any pride, like, there's no place for that here in a relationship with your wife. You know, and I think most guys, they might not admit it on a podcast or on social media, but I'm pretty sure the woman runs the household outside of the, you know, the perceived, you know, the, the uh, whatever they want to project to the public, you know, because... How can you not? You married a woman that you love. You married her because she has attribute qualities that you respect. So I don't think I'm anything different. I just recognize her for who she is. And that is it, you know. I think that's the extent of it. But, you know, I like to do this again. I mean... Anytime you have questions, I've always enjoyed our conversations. And, you know, we can make part two, part three, or whatever <laughs> conversation with my sister in law, my sister. You know, like I said, I'm so grateful for you and all your siblings and your family for the support that you've given us through these years. It's, it's beyond words, you know, my gratitude for you guys. And I really enjoyed this. And Me too. Thanks okay. a lot, Mesa. Thank you. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.